parliamentarians in the next steps in implementation of the Global Compact on Migration. That's leadership in shaping debate and discourse, leadership on policy and legislation, leadership on scrutiny and review, and leadership in dialogue. Um, and I'll go as briefly as I can, and we can come back to some of this if, if that's of interest. In terms of leadership and debate and discourse, this is both in terms of your role as parliamentarians in shaping debate on the compact itself and on migration in general. And that's what we've seen in the last couple of months, definitely in the last couple of weeks, is some debates on the compact which have been fact-based. They've not necessarily been based on what the nature of it is, nor what the content of the compact is. And so my appeal to you would be to spend the little bit of time it takes to read it, to understand where it's coming from, and to take into any of your own parliamentary debates an understanding of what the compact is and how it is trying to deliver for all people and not just for migrants. And it is explicit in that, in its opening bracket, that it's meant to be a compact for all people, that it's meant to address the legitimate concerns of all communities. Um, and the compact is itself explicit as well about the need for a fact-based discourse. And I think you all have the, the possibility to be part of shaping that, to be informed well about what the migration realities are in your country, what the migration realities are on routes towards or from your countries, and, and how that should shape domestic policy. In terms of the policy and legislative leadership, um, the, the compact is very clear and has a guiding principle on national sovereignty about the role that, um, that, that, that nations are sovereign in how they determine their migration um, policy. And again, some of that falls, falls to you. And so in, ta in taking that on, there's a, there's a responsibility to see what the whole of the compact is trying to do and how that can be brought through in your, in your policy and legislative functions. There are also um, within that some specific policy development actions. There are a lot of development actions. Just to be clear, the Global Compact on Migration has 23 objectives. I believe it has 187 actions. And nobody is expecting anybody to take those away and do them all tomorrow. That's not realistic. And it's not actually achievable. So what I'd like to encourage you to think of the compact and its actions as is not a burden, but a resource. It's a starting point and a, something to aim for in terms of how can we do better on this whole host of things, not how we must do better immediately on, on all of them at once. Um, but across the compact, there are specific policy development actions in a whole host of the um, the. Uh, objectives. One of the actions I'd like to read just as an example, and don't blame me, this is a negotiated document, this is not the greatest of prose, and that's from the objective on addressing and reducing vulnerabilities in migration. And it says to develop national policies and programs to improve national responses that address the needs of migrants in situations of vulnerability. And then it goes on because the sentences are long. But essentially in there, there's an action around taking a particular group of migrants and looking at how policy could be better geared towards reducing vulnerabilities. That's a clear policy development action that involves some degree of review of existing policy, some visioning of where you would like to go, um, and then ideally some uh, pragmatic steps towards it in its development. But it's not specific on how to do that. It's giving that responsibility back to states to say, find a way to do this that works for you. Um, then there are specific legislative actions in the Global Compact on, migra on Migration. And to be clear, the, the actions of the compact are presented as a menu of options, again, without the expectation that every state take on 187 actions at once, but that you look at where your priority needs are, where your priorities are, and you, you go from there. And one of the, so to give um, an example of one of the legislative actions, and in fact, the chapeau of the objective of um, objective 10, which is about trafficking, it says we commit to take legislative or other measures to prevent, combat or eradicate trafficking in persons in the context of international migration. Again, that's about having a look at what you have within your domestic legislation already and is that sufficient to, to combat and eradicate trafficking in persons? Is that a priority for your, for your country? But those thing, things that I've pulled out, if you pull out the policy-related actions, if you pull out the um, legislative actions, um, you get a piecemeal and incomplete approach. And I think one of the gifts and the challenges of the Global Compact is this attempt to take, as the co-facilitators described it, a full 360-degree view of migration. Um, and in order to 
have coherent and comprehensive responses. That requires um, some degree of uh, planning and some degree of kind of, of um, translation of the compact into national implementation plans. And that's what paragraph 53 of the compact asks for. It asks for a process to develop national implementation plans, and it asks for them to be reviewed and revised and developed, for them to be organic documents. It's very specifically not prescriptive about how to do that. It doesn't say you need to develop a national action plan. It doesn't say your government will have to report to the UN on its development of a national action plan. It says you need to consider how you're developing national implementation plans. Is that that there's an element on migrants in your health policy? Is that that there is an element on migrants in your education um, programs? Or is it that you need a comprehensive migration policy within that, within your how you approach things? In terms of leadership on scrutiny and review, there are, um, again, a lot of actions within this, and what I can do is pull these out and then share them with the IPU in case that's useful for you, where, they, where it explicitly asks for a review of existing policy. And again, the scrutiny and hearing functions of um, parliamentarians could be well used to fulfill those actions. As an example, again, in the objective on um, addressing and reducing vulnerability, in, migrant, in migration, the, the first action is to review relevant policies and practices to ensure that they do not create, exacerbate, or unintentionally increase vulnerabilities of migrants. And again, that's about how do you take policy on migration has been piecemeal a bit in your interior ministries, a bit in justice ministries, potentially in education ministries, potentially in health ministries. How do you take it as a piece, take a step back and look at it as an entire um, policy and how coherent is that policy and what is being done within each of those areas to ensure that it's not exacerbating the vulnerabilities of those who, who are on the move and in your countries. Um, finally, in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the kind of review and scrutiny function, coming back to that guiding principle on, on whole of society and the role that parliamentarians play in that, there's a role that you can play in kind of hearings that are undertaken in who do you bring in I mean, clearly, in pretty much all countries, there is very limited voting rights for migrants, but how are you hearing their experiences? How are you understanding what's actually happening for them, both in the countries, um, in your jurisdictions, but also what is happening to them on migratory routes towards or away from your countries? How are you seeking to hear from civil society, from migrants themselves, to again, make sure that policy development is, is based on, on fact and, and people's direct experience? And then what I wanted to, um, and then just to mention, I don't know if any of the countries here have um, national mechanisms for reporting and follow up on human rights recommendations, but there are models there that are potentially useful to include the, um, the actions and objectives of the compact into or to learn from in how to spread a large number of recommendations across government and how to then gather information on whether that's being done. Um, and then just to wrap up, uh, to say that um, in terms of leadership on dialogue, the, the Global Compact is presented very much as a cooperative framework. Um, that's what's at its heart, is that this is a global phenomenon that needs global responses, that individual national governments cannot manage this situation on their own, that what's required is dialogue between countries to achieve better responses. And what I would do is, is encourage those of you who are in this room who are clearly interested in dialogue with your counterparts from other countries to continue that and to ask about what does migration management need, what do your constituents need in the countries that you come from, and to think about what that means in terms of a global picture on migration and not just a national picture. One of the things that I found most frustrating having followed the negotiations and then seen this period in which states, some states have been pulling back from the Global Compact is that the document that we have is the product of a negotiation between 192 member states of the UN. It was what was possible when governments and government representatives listened to each other's needs and created a balanced picture for that spoke to all governments. And then what we have is a national debate on that and a, tear, a taking apart of that because it doesn't feel fair from the national context. But that's because the other parts of the world are not being heard in those conversations. And what role can you play in ensuring that when there's a national debate about migration policy, it's not based solely on what's happening in your country, but it's based on the global context because it's a global phenomenon. 
And again, as I say, I would look forward to the opportunity to meet in two years, in four years, when we come with another checklist on the Global Compact, when we can ask, is it effective? And when we're hopefully able to say, yes, it is. And this is the role that parliamentarians were able to play in making it so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for keeping the time. Right. Uh, I should say, before I call uh, the, the next speaker, we've agreed that we'll continue this session till 4.15, as we had a half-hour late start. So adding 15 minutes, so your coffee break will start at 4.15. OK? Uh, right. Uh, Serena. Uh, Ser uh, Serena Tarabia is from the International Committee for the Red Cross. She's on the ICRC delegation in Rabat, and she's called the protection delegate, whatever that means. You'll tell us. OK? Okay, sure. Excusez-moi, j'ai un petit souci avec la clé USB. J'espère le régler tout de suite. Oh là là <rire> On commence pas bien. <rire> Maintenant, je ne vois même plus le... la souris. Pas... Bon, on peut faire ça, hein c'est pas grave. Non, non, mais... Je ne vois pas même pas où. Attends. C'est pas grave, je vais. Bon. Euh, non, non, mais si, si tu peux le remettre, mm -hmm. je vais essayer. Et ça fonctionnait au début. Yeah, je crois yeah. que c'est pas moi qui ai fait quelque chose de mauvais. Non, c'est pas grave, honnêtement. Okay, C'était vraiment juste les messages clés, mais je peux. Euh... Tu veux que j'attende Ok. Bon, alors entre temps, euh... est-ce que vous êtes encore là tous avec moi <rire> Vous n'êtes pas endormi entre temps. <rire> Alors bonjour à toutes et à tous. Je m'appelle Serena Tarabia, de nationalité italienne, mais actuellement je vis au Maroc. Je suis, euh, exactement comme on m'a présenté, déléguée protection au Comité international de la Croix-Rouge, CICR. Euh, c'est vrai que déléguée protection, c'est euh, une définition un peu compliquée, ce n'est pas évident pour... Euh, pour les externes, de comprendre qu'est-ce que ça signifie. Donc, euh, pour le CICR, je ne sais pas, est-ce que parmi vous, il y a quelqu'un qui connaît la mission du CICR, qui connaît notre travail humanitaire Oui, la première ligne. La France, très bien, oui, on a une délégation à Paris, donc... <rire> OK, bon, en général, euh, bon, le CICR est une organisation internationale, neutre, impartiale et indépendante, qui a pour but principal, celui d'amener protection et assistance euh, aux victimes des conflits armés, d'autres situations de violence et des catastrophes. Donc pour nous, la protection est l'ensemble de toutes ces activités qui euh, euh, protègent la vie et la dignité de l'être humain, et donc euh, qui ont pas mal de liens avec le pacte mondial sur la migration duquel euh, on parle aujourd'hui euh, et demain. Donc euh, je vais essayer de lire pour ne pas rater... <rire> Donc, on est actif depuis plus de 150 ans, donc c'est aussi une organisation internationale qui a une histoire très longue. Et on est présent dans plus de 90 pays au monde. Notre siège est à Genève, en Suisse, mais on travaille dans toutes les régions du monde, y compris ici au Maroc, où on a une délégation à Rabat depuis 2015. Merci. 
Concrètement, je continue. Donc, dans tous ces contextes, donc plus de 90 pays, on coopère avec les sociétés nationales de la Croix-Rouge et du Croissant Rouge qui existent dans chaque pays. La Croix-Rouge italienne, la Croix-Rouge française, etc., etc. La Croix-Rouge sénégalaise, le Croissant Rouge marocain, etc., etc. Et ensemble, on partage les mêmes valeurs humanitaires et on compose le mouvement international de la Croix-Rouge et du Croissant Rouge. Notre travail est purement humanitaire et se base sur les conventions de Genève et sur les statuts de ce mouvement, le mouvement international de la Croix-Rouge et du Croissant Rouge. Ces statuts, qui sont acceptés par les États, nous confèrent aussi un droit d'initiative humanitaire qui est à la base de notre action dans le domaine de la migration. Donc notre mandat principal est plutôt lié aux conflits et aux situations de violence. Merci beaucoup. Mais pendant les dernières dix années surtout, on a commencé à s'engager aussi dans le cadre de la migration, justement dans la plupart des contextes, sur la, sur la base de ce droit d'initiative humanitaire. Ok, là vous le voyez, c'est bien. <rire> euh, donc, le CICR n'a pas l'ambition de se transformer en une agence dédiée à la migration. Il y a déjà d'autres agences, je suis sûre que vous avez rencontré les représentants de l'OIM, l'Organisation mondiale pour la migration, ce matin. Il y a le Haut commissariat des Nations unies pour les réfugiés. Le CICR n'a pas l'intention de se transformer en encore une autre agence qui se dédie à la migration, mais on est sérieusement préoccupé par les conséquences humanitaires que le phénomène migratoire a sur des millions de vies. C'est un phénomène qui peut être volontaire ou non, et dont les causes sont souvent complexes. On estime qu'au-delà de la protection plus large octroyée aux réfugiés et aux demandeurs d'asile par le droit international des réfugiés, toute personne qui a quitté son pays à la recherche de plus de sécurité ou d'opportunités, y compris donc les migrants en situation régulière ou irrégulière, doit bénéficier de la protection offerte par le droit international humanitaire, là où il s'applique, et par le droit international des droits de l'homme. Grâce à notre présence le long des routes migratoires, dans les pays d'origine, de transit et des destinations à travers le monde, on a donc entamé une action ciblée, axée sur nos domaines d'expertise, entre autres le rétablissement des liens familiaux et la médecine légale. Chaque année, un nombre inquiétant des migrants disparaissent, Selon les chiffres de l'OIM, 3 341 migrants sont morts sur les routes migratoires en 2018 dans le monde entier et plus de 22 000 dans les dernières quatre années. Le CICR accueille donc favorablement l'objectif 8 du pacte mondial, avec lequel les États s'engagent à prévenir les morts et les disparitions et à établir des mécanismes internationaux de coordination pour les migrants disparus. Cet objectif est entièrement en ligne avec les recommandations fournies par le CICR aux décideurs politiques, donc même à vous qui êtes là aujourd'hui et qui pouvez influencer le processus législatif dans vos pays. Donc, les recommandations fournies par le CICR aux décideurs politiques concernant les migrants disparus et leurs familles peuvent être regroupées en trois volets principaux. Le premier, prévenir la disparition des migrants y compris en leur permettant de rétablir et de maintenir le contact avec leur famille le long de la route migratoire, une fois arrivés à destination, y compris dans les centres de détention ou rétention là où il y en a. Deuxièmement, deuxième groupe de recommandations, faciliter la recherche et l'identification des migrants portés disparus à travers une gestion digne des dépouilles mortelles ainsi que la collecte d'informations sur les migrants disparus et leurs dépouilles selon les standards internationaux de médecine légale et de protection des données. Le but étant évidemment d'éclaircir leur sort et d'informer leurs familles de leur sort. Troisième groupe de recommandations, répondre aux besoins spécifiques des familles des migrants disparus. Donc pas seulement la recherche de la vérité, donc dévoiler quel a été leur sort, mais aussi les aider à exercer leurs droits et à avoir accès aux services. Donc, tel que mentionné dans le paragraphe 44, en fait c'est le même paragraphe que notre collègue Laurel a mentionné euh, il y a un moment, et qui prévoit un rôle pour le parlementaire 
de chaque pays dans la mise en œuvre du pacte mondial. Alors, ce même paragraphe 44 prévoit aussi un rôle pour les mouvements internationaux de la Croix-Rouge et du Croissant Rouge, un soutien aux États dans la mise en œuvre du pacte mondial sur la migration. Le CICR, en particulier, a des dizaines d'années d'expertise de travail avec les personnes disparues et avec leurs familles. Donc, je souhaiterais vous faire quelques exemples de comment le CICR pourrait aider les autorités, si bien dans les pays d'origine, de transit et de destination des migrants, pour opérationnaliser l'objectif 8, en particulier, du Pacte mondial sur les migrations. Donc, on va reprendre les trois groupes de recommandations qu'on a vues il y a un moment et voir quelle pourrait être l'action du CICR euh, en appui aux autorités. Donc, en ce qui concerne la prévention des disparitions des migrants, il faut d'abord expliquer que les routes migratoires sont souvent dangereuses, on le sait très bien. On parle beaucoup des morts en Méditerranée, mais il faut savoir aussi que euh, tout le long de la route, il y a des périls, des dangers et des morts, y compris à, à travers le désert du Sahara, par exemple. Et donc la probabilité que des migrants disparaissent existe. Et le maintien du contact avec la famille le long de la route migratoire et une fois arrivé à destination peut réduire le nombre des migrants portés disparus. Donc, en coopération avec les sociétés nationales de Croix-Rouge et de Croissant-Rouge, qui existent dans chaque pays au monde, le CICR offre le service qu'on appelle « Rétablissement des liens familiaux », RLF, qui permet aux migrants de communiquer gratuitement avec leurs familles et, leur, et de chercher leurs proches, y compris surtout en Europe, à travers une plateforme en ligne qui s'appelle « Trace the Face » et qui a été fondée par les sociétés nationales de Croix-Rouge et Croissant-Rouge européennes. En ce qui concerne la facilitation de la recherche et de l'identification des migrants portés disparus, les experts en médecine légale peuvent jouer un rôle central dans l'éclaircissement du sort des migrants portés disparus. En revanche, ce n'est pas une tâche facile. L'identification des dépouilles des migrants peut être très compliquée, surtout puisque la migration est un phénomène transfrontalier. Donc, ça implique déjà les autorités et les intervenants de plusieurs pays. Et en l'absence de bases de données centralisées, de procédures standardisées pour la collecte d'informations, depuis les, dépou les, les dépouilles mortelles, mais aussi depuis les familles des migrants disparus, et même simplement en l'absence de communication entre les autorités ayant documenté les dépouilles non identifiées et les familles des migrants disparus qui, normalement, se trouvent dans d'autres pays. Donc, tout ça sont des défis qu'il faut prendre en considération et qui peuvent rendre vraiment difficile l'identification des dépouilles et la possibilité de fournir des réponses aux familles qui cherchent leurs proches. Donc, à travers nos experts en médecine légale, on peut aider à renforcer les capacités des intervenants dans la gestion des dépouilles mortelles des migrants. Mais on peut aussi aider les autorités à standardiser la collecte d'informations depuis les dépouilles non identifiées et à centraliser les données. On peut encore faciliter l'échange et la comparaison parmi différents pays des données antémortem, donc les données qui sont collectées euh, à propos des migrants portés disparus depuis leur famille, et les données post-mortem, donc ces données qui sont collectées depuis les dépouilles non identifiées. Il y a plusieurs pays ici, je pense, où on a des projets. Il y a le Mexique, euh, il y a l'Italie, il y a la Grèce. Euh, il s'agit de, de pays où le CICR a des projets en appui aux autorités et aux intervenants dans ce cadre. Concernant le soutien et l'accompagnement aux familles des migrants portés disparus, évidemment, le manque de nouvelles d'un proche peut être traumatisant. Et donc, il faut toujours tenir en compte que les procédures de collecte d'informations auprès des familles des migrants disparus doivent avoir pour but aussi celui de limiter leur souffrance. Mais il y a d'autres éléments. En plus du traumatisme et de l'attente de nouvelles, ces familles doivent souvent faire face à des défis d'ordre administratif, juridique, économique, qui parfois leur empêchent de jouir de leurs droits et d'accéder aux services. Par exemple, lorsqu'aucun statut juridique spécifique n'est reconnu pour les personnes portées disparues, leurs familles se heurtent à des difficultés, par exemple, dans l'exercice de leurs droits à la propriété ou à l'héritage, du droit de se remarier, des droits parentaux ou encore des droits aux prestations sociales. Donc, grâce à son expertise en droit, le CICR peut aider les autorités à éliminer ces obstacles administratifs et juridiques. Par exemple, on a rédigé des principes directeurs. Uh, excuse me, uh, three minutes, please. All right, I'm almost done. 
<rire> Nulle idée. Donc, par exemple, on a rédigé des principes directeurs qui peuvent suggérer aux États un modèle de disposition législative pour la protection des personnes disparues, qui inclut aussi, par exemple, un modèle de certificat d'absence que les autorités compétentes peuvent octroyer aux familles des disparus pour qu'elles puissent jouir de leurs droits. Mais aussi avec le soutien des sociétés nationales de Croix-Rouge et des croissants rouges, on peut participer à la réalisation des programmes multidisciplinaires, par exemple soutien économique, soutien psychosocial, pour soutenir les familles des migrants disparus pendant leur absence. Donc, au-delà de l'objectif 8 duquel on vient de parler, le pacte mondial, comme le disait notre collègue Laurel il y a un moment, est un document à 360 degrés qui touche à tous les aspects de la migration, et qui est censé encadrer la discussion et les politiques sur le phénomène migratoire dans les années à venir. Donc, en tant que CICR, on encourage les États à ne pas baisser la barre, donc à respecter leur obligation au regard du droit international, à veiller à ce que leur législation nationale et leurs procédures internes protègent la sécurité et la dignité des migrants, à élaborer des politiques qui prennent en considération les besoins des migrants en matière d'assistance et de protection. Donc, euh, j'ai fini mon intervention. Euh, cela a été un honneur pour moi de pouvoir être parmi vous aujourd'hui et vous présenter le rôle que l'organisation pour laquelle je travaille peut euh, jouer en appui aux autorités de tous vos États euh, pour la protection des migrants, et notamment concernant les migrants disparus et leurs familles. Si vous souhaitez en savoir plus sur le CICR, donc vous avez évidemment notre page web qui est disponible en plusieurs langues. Il y a une page pays spécifique sur le Maroc, si vous souhaitez connaître nos activités au Royaume du Maroc. Il y a une page sur le rétablissement des liens familiaux, où vous trouverez toutes les activités du mouvement Croix-Rouge et Croissant-Rouge dans tous les pays au monde concernant les liens familiaux. Et ce site a aussi une section, le Trace the Face, dont je parlais, qui permet aux, migrants disparus, aux familles des migrants disparus et aux migrants en Europe de se chercher mutuellement à travers cette plateforme. Ensuite, vous pouvez toujours nous contacter, surtout ceux parmi vous qui sont basés au Maroc. Et dernière chose, si parmi vous, il y a quelqu'un qui part à Marrakech ce week-end pour les side events du Pacte mondial, le CICR organise un événement ce dimanche de 13h à 15h qui porte justement sur le sujet des migrants disparus. Donc si vous voulez en savoir plus, vous êtes les bienvenus. Merci de votre attention. Right, thank you very much indeed, and thank you for keeping to time. I think the right procedure now is that we, um, is that we take questions in fives. That's to say, I'll take five questions, roughly, uh, if I can identify you all, and then we'll have the panelists, panelists respond, and then if there's time, we'll have another five. Please don't make long speeches. Could you, could you keep your intervention short so that more people have a chance to, to, to play their part in the session? Right, who wants to go? Who wants to go first? Um, Indonesia, right? Indonesia, right? Okay. Af okay. Okay. One, two, three. Indonesia first, please, and then Austria, and then Algeria, and then, and then Tunisia, and I can't read. Thailand. Thailand. Okay. Right. Indonesia, please. Shukran Sayyidir Rais ala hadil fursa. يرحب مجلس النواب الإندونيسي باعتماد الاتفاق العالمي من أجل الهجرة الآمنة والمنظمة والمنتظمة باعتباره الإطار العالمي الأول الذي يهدف إلى معالجة قضايا الهجرة بشكل شامل وباستئناف اللاجئين تطرقت قضايا الهجرة أيضا إلى حياة, اللاجئين إلى حياة الملايين من الناس بمن فيهم مواطنون نتوقع أن تستحوذ هذه الميثاق على جميع جوانب الهجرة بما في ذلك الجوانب الإنسانية والإنمائية والبيئية وحقوق الإنسان ولكن الأهم من ذلك أنه ينبغي أن تكون هذه الميثاق قادرة على وضع الإجراءات الضرورية التي يجب اتخاذها وضمان التزام الدول ليس فقط بهذا الميثاق وثيقة ولكن تنفيذ المبادئ بشكل فعال نأخذ علما بسياسة والقضايا التي تتناولها الميثاق وقد ساهمت إندونيسيا في هذا الصدد 
fi isra idzalikal mithaq bima fi dzalika man'u tajrimil muhajirin ghairul qanuniyin wa i'timadul ittifaqiyati dawliyah li himayati huquqi jami'il ummal al muhajirin wa ifradu usarihim ka wahidatin min al mithaq wa tashji'u at tasdiq ala suquq ad dawliyah dhat as silah wa ta'zizu at tamkin al iqtisadi lil muhajirin wa ta'zizu dawri al qita'at al khassati wa irbab al amali fi himayati al muhajirin wa li dhaman tanfidh hadha al mithaq bi shaklin fa'al al iltizam al alami dharuriyan wa fi hadha as sadad na'sifu bi shiddah li insihab al adid min al buldan min mufawadat al mithaq allati ta'qisu adam al raghbati fi tafkiri fi masirin wa huquq al malayin min al muhajirin alladhina ya'malun wa yuqimuna fi al buldan al ma'niyah inna qadaya al hijra wal muhajirin mut'addidatu al ab'ad wa qad tata'adda al masaru al mufassal fi itar hadha al mithaq wa ma'a dhalik yajibu an tusbiha hadha al mithaq an an yusbih hadha al mithaq al hall al shamila fi hall qadaya al hijra al alamiyah wa dhamana ilghai al ubudiyyati wal istighlal fi al asr al hadith ala hadha al nahwi yajibu an yakuna hadha al mithaq qadiratan ala at takayyuf ma'a al wad'i wa tahaddiyat al jadidah ma'a ishraq al ashkhas wal muhajirin fil amaliyati bi akmalha yajibu aidan ta'zizu hadha al mithaq fahmihi laysa faqat min qibali sani' al siyasat walakin aidan al mujtama'at al mahalliyah akhiran lada su'al qasir ila a'dha'il lajnah hal hunaka tariqatun tumkinu al ummal al mutahida min dhamani al i'timad al alami ala hadha al mithaq syukran Right. Thank you for that. Uh, now, I think, I hope I've got them in the right order. Austria, Tunisia, Pakistan and Thailand. Okay? Austria, please. Um, I most welcome the United Nations move to take up the subject migration and I'm, um, I also welcome that uh, the Interparliamentary Union takes up the subject at this conference. I want to remind of a quote by John Donne, No man is an island. And no man is an island applies not only to modern climate policy, it also applies, of course, to migration policy. Um, as for me, no government should it exclude itself from this dialogue, which is made possible by such conferences. And no government, no parliament should exclude itself from the process of developing joint positions, international positions, on the question of migration. For me, this conference is quite valuable because it gives an impulse to the debates in all parliaments, also in the parliament in Austria, where there are divided positions on this issue. And uh, anyway, the point is to stop the dying in the Mediterranean Sea. The point is to stop illegal immigration. That means we, we have to find supranational, international, solutions for this question and in this case I think we are moving forward this step also with this conference. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that. Right, I now call Tunisia, please. The Mutazaid, the Bahar Abid Mutawasat, Shamalan, and Janubin. The Hijra is not a way of Rakhina, and the Maslahatun is a man for the Hijra Amina, by the Karatein, Afriqia, Janubin, and Europa Shamalan. The Zamilati. موضوع الهجرة مرتبط شديد الارتباط بالتنمية لذلك وجب إيجاد حلول تنموية من أجل تنظيم الهجرة والحد منها نحن في تونس نعلم جيدا تبعات الهجرة غير النظامية والهجرة الجماعية وقضايا اللجوء فتونس بلد رائد في هذا المجال يا سادتي اسمحوا لي فقد استقبلت تونس في عام 2011 أكثر من مليون ليبي ومن جنسيات أخرى غداة الثورة الليبية وتونس في تلك الفترة ما زالت جريحة ليس بأفضل حال من شقيقة ليبيا تمر بانتقال ديمقراطي صعب ولكن نجحنا في المهمة لأننا تعطينا مع قضية الجوار بمنطق إنساني بحت فتحنا البيوت والقلوب قبل أن نبني مخيمات للاجئين نحن ملتزمون في تونس باتفاقات مع الحكومات والسلطات في أوروبا حول ملف الهجرة غير النظامية نقوم بأدوارنا في مراقبة الحدود البحرية والبرية وفي التوعية 
والتحسيس بمخاطر الهجرة غير النظامية عبر قوارب الموت التي تشق البحر الأبيض المتوسط بحثا عن تحسين ظروف العيش وشغل أفضل هذا هو السؤال يا سادتي نحن ملتزمون ولكن ما مدى التزام شركائنا بدفع, بدفع التنمية في جنوب المتوسط وبالمساهمة في الاستقرار التنموي والاقتصادي في دول منشأ المهاجرين إن القضية قضية تنمية بالأساس قضية شغل وعيش كريم بسبب التفاوت الكبير بين الشمال المتوسط وجنوبه ومصلحتنا مشتركة في هذا المجال دول شمال إفريقيا تمثل صمام أمان لأوروبا ولكن نحن ندفع أيضا ضريبة باهظة بهجرة شبابنا وفي كفاءاتنا وكوادرنا الذين يمثلون الثروة بشرية تغادر في اتجاه أوروبا وهي قوة خير وعاملة وقوة إنتاج تساهم في ازدهار أوروبا وفي تنميتها وليست قوة تخريب كما يروج نريد أن نفهم هذه المواثيق الدولية التي تفرض حسن الجوار وإعلاء القيم الإنسانية الكونية التي تجمعنا داخل هذا البرلمان على المصالح الضيقة للأطراف والفئات هي الوسيلة لإيجاد حلول للهجرة غير النظامية أما منطقة الربح والمصلحة وهل سيتناول اتفاقنا سبل حماية المهاجرين ودمجهم في بلدان جديدة أو إعادتهم إلى أوطانهم الأصلية فقط أنا سعيد جدا بمعرفة الآنسة سيرانا والتي تحدثت عن موضوع المهاجرين المفقودين نحن هذا الملف نعاني منه منذ سبع سنوات منذ 2011 تم معناتها فقدان أكثر من 500 تونسي الموضوع مازال مطروح نباشره يوميا مع عائلات مفقودين اللي معناتها يلقاوا عديد الصعوبات لحل حالة هذه الأزمة إن شاء الله نقوم بعديد التنسيق مع بعضنا حتى نغلط إلى الحقيقة والحقيقة اللي ينتظرها عائلات المفقودين وشكرا right, thank you. Uh, may I call Pakistan please Pakistan Oh. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Shazia Mari. I'm a member of parliament from Pakistan. I'd first like to also thank the hosts of this event um, and also IPU. I'd also like to thank all the speakers. We've been listening to some really informative uh, uh, presentations since morning. I missed asking a question during the previous session, but nonetheless, I uh, would appreciate the speakers here again. Both the ladies did a wonderful job. Um, my question would be to um, Ms. Townhead. Uh, she explained about the four steps that the parliamentarians should be taking in order to holistically look at the issue of uh, migrants. Undoubtedly, this is a reality. And the most unfortunate reality is when such migrations take place as a result of conflicts. Um, I feel that, yes, women are affected, half of the population. And to me as a mother, what is most disturbing is the children are actually really affected. Today I, w I was going through a report which said about 68 million people are displaced. This was the last figure, out of which 25.4 million were children, and half of that number was children under 18. So this is actually quite alarming and sad. Uh, what I'd like to precisely ask you is what can be a mechanism, like you did talk about monitoring, but um, it's all statements. I'm very happy to hear things that the concern that I have would translate into reality if there is actually a mechanism to monitor the agreements that we commit ourselves to. We are going to commit ourselves to yet another agreement, and that's going to be the compact that we all know about. But it's, it's, it's a political document. There is no compulsion in many ways. So what can be a best or the best way to use this compact to resolve these issues uh, in a more sustainable manner, A, and Secondly, I'd like to appreciate Red Crescent, because I, uh, ICRC has been in Pakistan right from its inception, 1947, when the subcontinent was divided into two, and both the countries that were being divided requested the Red Crescent to be on their side during all the bloodshed that took place, unfortunately. So, uh, you know, appreciation for the efforts that you put in then for us. 
Um, but this coming back to the question, I'd, I'd really like to ask if there is a real mechanism that can be put into place to ensure that the countries who are sitting here would look into this issue with the kind of passion that we all feel about when it comes to our own country. For instance, many Pakistanis are working in, uh, in different countries um, overseas. Uh, most of them are working in the Middle Eastern countries, but unfortunately, the working conditions are very, very bad. There are extreme uh, conditions that they're working in. Now, such dialogue can, can surely help us in sort of identifying uh, these issues and registering the concerns with the relevant country. But how can IPU help or how can an, a forum like UN help and prepare a mechanism that would ensure resolution to this problem? Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. And then Thailand is the fifth, question, fifth country. Thailand, please. And then we'll go to, an, we'll have the, after we've had these five, we'll then go to the responses and then we'll have another five. Like Thailand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Lord Alfred Dobbs, uh, I hope I addressed you correctly. I, I came in uh, a bit late, but I heard about your joke that uh, during your time to, uh, as a member of House of Commons, I hope there's no policeman coming to ask you again. And I believe that what we discuss uh, in this session uh, matters. Uh, we discuss the, the, the heading of this session is a guide for parliamentarians in implementing the global compact. Uh, of course, I have read uh, the document uh, provided uh, uh, to us, and uh, I found that there's no clear guide as yet on what we should do. Even on the, on the uh, 23 objectives, it does, it, they, they don't uh, spell clearly what parliamentary should do, except that we have to look into it and, and how, how it's uh, applicable to, to the parliament. Uh, I, like, I like mostly the, the last one about the, 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 the uh, partnership. I think there is something that we can play a good role in that. Of course, we representing people, and we uh, can partner best with the people, not only the general public, but also uh, business sector, uh, uh, you know, NGOs and others who are active uh, in this uh, particular matter. And of course, uh, uh, in March, I think IPU uh, discussed uh, this topic, and uh, they agree that, that the way forward, uh, saying along with the governments and the UN, including in particular IOM and UNSCR, parliament, uh, parliaments should have a key role to play in the implementation of the global compacts. Our task as parliamentarians is to hold governments accountable for their commitments and to see to it that laws and budgets are consistent with those commitments. And uh, later on, I think last October, there is a kind of resolution on uh, a related matter, calls on IPU and its member parliaments with the support of the IOM, International Organization for Migration, to develop a parliamentary plan of action on migration by the end of 2019. Uh, 2019 is coming close, but uh, I think we uh, should work fast so that to to keep up what uh, on what with uh, what going to happen in Marrakesh and perhaps later on in New York. Uh, so so far, I think uh, apart from the partnership uh, things, uh, we always talking about the oversight role, budgeting, and. Last but not least, legislation. I think for us, uh, legal framework is also very important. We have been working on that a lot. Uh, for our parliament in the past four years, we have been uh, working to, to make sure that all uh, people will be taken care of, not only 
uh, of course, uh, Thai nationals, but also uh, uh, migrant workers and so on and so forth. So, so we have uh, done a lot on legal framework and we are, are doing that at the level of regional cooperation as well. ASEAN has a couple of convention and plan of action, especially on uh, human trafficking uh, 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 you know, implementation uh, to counter uh, 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 human trafficking, especially women and, and, and children. And next year, Thailand is chairing ASEAN, and we hope we can do more on that. And uh, I hope that from this session, uh, we would have a clear picture on what we are going to do next. And I leave it to you, sir, my lord, to give us some guiding light. Right, thank you very much indeed. I'd now like to refer those questions to the panel members. You don't have to answer them all, as many as you feel comfortable. Do you want to go first? First one? Uh. Okay, okay. I'm going to take this off because I like speaking and I like listening, but I'm not sure I like listening to myself as I'm speaking. Um, just to pick up a couple of those questions, um, if I understood the question from Indonesia, it was about how to ensure that all were signing on. I guess that's about understanding what the document is and what level of commitment is being made and understanding it well as a cooperative framework, that it really isn't meant to be a stick to beat states with. It's meant to be this cooperative framework through which states can work better together on, as I said, an inherently trans-border um, phenomenon. Um, on the question from um, Pakistan, on, on women and children, these have been read throughout the compact relatively well. Um, there will be guidance coming, I believe, from UN Women um, done uh, in collaboration with members of civil society who work on, with women migrants around how to implement this in a gender responsive way. Similarly, I believe that um, those who've been working in something called the Initiative for Child Rights in both global compacts will be looking at what does it mean to do a, ch a child um, sensitive implementation of the compact. So guidance is, is coming on those things, I guess. The, the situation is that it's been an intense negotiation period, this slightly strange hiatus between now and Marrakesh, but the, the guidance will come. People are working on those situations. I'm going to use this to plug our piece of guidance, which is um, not our guidance at all, in fact, but what we put together was existing recommendations from the UN's special procedures, so the special rapporteur on the human rights of migrants, but also on trafficking, on health, on food, on all of the rapporteurs who have spoken specifically to the rights of migrants in their reports and from the treaty bodies as well, again, from the, um, the Committee on Migrant Workers, but also from the Committee on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, Committee on the Human Rights Committee, CEDAW, all of them pulling together where they have explicit recommendations and mapping those against the objectives, precisely so that there's something for those who want to implement this to look at and say, you're not starting from scratch. We have these actions under the objectives, but you're right, there are further steps on what does this actually mean in practice. So what that is, is a compilation of examples, of ideas, of guidance, of recommendations already existing from the UN human rights system on what that might mean in practice. We have some copies of that, but that's my plug. Um, in relation to the monitoring mechanism, um, Monitoring mechanisms are there as a lever to encourage national action. They're not an end in and of themselves. So the reason what, we, what can be done about creating actual change is for governments to go away and do it and for you to take on your role, as your Thai um, colleague says, your role in accountability, your role in holding the governments to account to actually deliver it. And that will come best, strongest, and most appropriately at a national level. Is, is what I would say on that. We, there are monitoring mechanisms which can look at this, but, but it will come best and most strongly from the national level. Um, and that's, that's what I would say for now. Thank, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Is it functioning? Yeah. <laughs> Too much? <laughs> okay, I hope you can hear me now. <laughs> I wanted to say something to um, Pakistan first. So I think the point on children is very interesting because we tend to think of migration about, like, as a phenomenon about young men migrating to seek job opportunities abroad, but that's not entirely true. 
Um, and we see, for example, even here in Morocco, many families, women or men, accompanied by their children. So it brings up a very important point. Of course, our specialty in ICRC is uh, family links, so we tend to always think about that. It's important for states to prevent family separations, first of all. So when it comes to families migrating, it's important that states pay attention not to separate spouses or eventually parents from their children uh, during uh, the migration process. And that also entails paying attention to retention or like, detention of immigrants, which is a phenomenon that typically can cause this kind of separations. Uh, so this in terms of policies, and then in terms of services, it's important to always easily identify what are unaccompanied and separated children, meaning minors who are separated from their parents or eventually all their adult relatives, and refer them to um, either state institutions or humanitarian organizations who can uh, provide them with services and protection, help them restore family contact, so typically the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, and uh, let's say assist them until Uh, family reunification. Et ensuite, j'avais uh, un point pour la Tunisie qui, uh, qui en parlait de nous. Alors, on a une délégation du CICR uh, à Tunis depuis des années. Et il y a des collègues là-bas qui s'occupent aussi du phénomène migratoire et du rétablissement des liens familiaux, que ce soit pour les familles tunisiennes qui cherchent leurs proches ou que ce soit aussi pour toutes les autres nationalités qui, uh, sur la route migratoire, passent par la Tunisie. Donc, euh, si je ne me trompe pas, ensuite, personnellement, je travaille pas là-bas, mais euh, si je ne me trompe pas, eux, ils s'occupent aussi de coopérer avec le croissant rouge tunisien pour la gestion des dépouilles mortelles, par exemple, pour les corps qui sont retrouvés sur les plages ou dans les eaux tunisiennes. Donc, euh, je pense que vous pouvez euh, euh, vous, vous référer à la délégation du CICR en Tunisie si vous avez besoin de coopération ou d'appui euh, dans ce domaine. Merci. Right, we'll go to the next lot of five questions. I hope I've got this right. Uh, UK, Zimbabwe, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Turkish language speaking countries, uh, Greece, and then Algeria. Right? Those are the five. Oh, have I missed somebody? Uh, what, what, what? Um, there is um, Iraq. Iraq. Oh. Iraq. Iraq. Well, look. I tell you what, we'll see if we can get a third lot going. Look, if you can keep your intervention short, we can get a th an, an, another round after, the, after these five, okay? I've been taking them in the order in which I've been able to see them, so we'll do our best to get you all in. Okay, UK. Thank you very much. Is it working? Yes. Uh, oh. Thank you very much, and I will, I will try to be brief. Uh, I think the wider context here for this discussion on the new global compact has to be has to include uh, the new global compact on uh, refugees and also the lack of faith and commitment internationally to a system of rules and cooperation that most countries adhere to and I think we uh, uh, perhaps in this discussion because the compact reads well, and because the speakers have all been very good, we're maybe all feeling very positive. But this discussion is taking place against an international crisis that is inhumane. The 30 million children that were mentioned by the representative from Pakistan uh, are displaced from their homes, and they are facing a future of uncertainty and fear uh, that the world at the moment is doing very little about and I think that we when we have this discussion we need to inject some <coughs> urgency into the actions that are uh, uh, required and I think that the the crisis affects every continent in Europe there are far too many governments that are ignoring international law uh, in relation to both migration and refugees and, and elsewhere in the world there are there are far too many countries where people feel so frightened uh, or so scared about the futures that they feel that they have to move Uh, and and that is, that is the, those are the two ends of the spectrum here. And unless we're dealing with both, then we're not dealing with the issue uh, honestly and, and accurately. And I do think there is perhaps a framework uh, here that we are not uh, fully integrating into the discussion. And I'd be interested to know what both speakers feel about the global goals, about Agenda 2030, which is referenced in the document, I think maybe on two or three occasions, 
but it's very much a passing reference. And it seems to me that a, strate a global strategy based around the global goals that, is, that looks for a comprehensive set of solutions implemented nationally to deal with what, are a, what is a comprehensive set of problems has to be part of the solution on migration. And yet, it's not really been touched on in, in the debate at all today. So I'd be interested in what both speakers would say about that. Right, thank you. Zimbabwe, please. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I hope so. Yes, yes. What, 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 I, need, uh, what I need to, uh, to question is after what I would have uh, said to you now. Uh, I need uh, to motivate the question using what I've got, because Zimbabwe, where it is based in the southern Africa, in the SADC region, also plays host to a lot of migrants coming in from Somalia and coming in from DRC. Which countries uh, have an epidemic of uh, Ebola, some of them, and some cholera and typhoid and all that. So they import some of that into uh, mainstream land, Zimbabwe, and we as a country, uh, we are um, past colony of the United Kingdom. I'm happy that my brother is seated here from the House of Commons. Uh, we had a bilateral uh, disagreement, uh, which was a land issue and it's passed. But the issue that I ask that uh, this House and members of Parliament from other jurisdictions do uh, is to try and get the United States, the European Union, and other partners to help Zimbabwe in first and foremost demining activities from uh, the pre-independence war that we had a protracted struggle uh, for independence for the emancipation of the formerly marginalized black majority. Um, to that extent, we had a half-hearted uh, approach from the European Union and partners in trying to demine the eastern highlands of Zimbabwe. This is a corridor from which we get our migrants through. We are not doing it only for the sovereign initiative of Zimbabwe, but we are doing it for the migrants that are coming in from other jurisdictions who do not know that these corridors are mined so that we do not lose life unnecessarily. The second issue, there is now pressure on the existing infrastructure in terms of water and sewer reticulation. There is a dilapidated, disused, and um, uh, pipes that could do with rehabilitation. So it is my clarion call here for that we get resources in order to capacitate this old and disused infrastructure that is now having pressure on it from those that are coming in whom we have not turned back as a country. We certainly have come here to support uh, the ratification and the signing of the compact agreement. That is it might be. We want help from uh, the, 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 the chair and his uh, other comrades that are here in order to capacitate uh, our country to enhance the ability to host these migrants and also to get the United States to remove the debilitating economic sanctions that are on Zimbabwe. Because as a nation, we are endowed with a ubiquitous amount of mineral wealth, but we do not have the financial leverage and the withdrawal will to pay back our uh, uh, international obligations because we've got an albatross of these sanctions around our neck. My question, therefore, is that how can this organization uh, uh, and advocates and proponents of uh, this contact uh, progressive uh, agreement be able to push towards my clarion call to encourage those members that have put sanctions on us to remove them and those that were formerly our enemies 
to come back to Zimbabwe because we now have a second republic under the stewardship of uh, Comrade Emerson Dambuzomnangagwa. And he has said in various fora that Zimbabwe should no longer be perceived and viewed as a pariah state anymore. It is now open for business. And I also, uh, during this uh, momentous occasion, encourage all of you members states to come to Zimbabwe and visit the Victoria Falls. I thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that. As I say, please keep the interventions short so we can get you all in. Right, the next one is, uh, now I've, I hope I've got this right, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Turkic Speaking Countries. Is that right? Please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Honorable participants, my name is Mustafa Jambe, and I am a member of Grand National Assembly of Turkey. I am here on behalf of Parliamentary Assembly of Turkic speaking countries, Turkba. First of all, I would like to present the greetings of Chairman of Turkba and Speaker of Grand National Assembly of Turkey, Mr. Binali Yildirim. I want to draw your attention to the future. Migration is not new, but world is not sure about what, what to do with it. While migration has always been a part of human history, nowadays borders and state are quite different, different and solid than ever. Is it possible to elimination migration? There are different phases of migration, seeking a better life or escaping from unfavorable conditions. Migrants face unspeakable dif difficulties and dangers during their journey. There is a reason for them to undertake such challenges. The primary ca cause for waves of migration is socioeconomic unfairness and inequality. In one hand, the gap between the rich and the poor is widening. In another hand, the middle class is in decline. Global stratification has reached such a level that the poor in the in developed countries have better conditions than middle or even upper middle cl class of other countries. Some others predict that the middle class probably will disappear in the following decades. In that case, migration shall increase. Conscience and calamity should be our guide. I would like to draw your attention to that uh, one end of migrants meets one end of refugees. Following, following the New York Declaration on 2016, highly anticipated global compact on migration is a very important achievement. But it must be complemented by the global compact on refugees. Turkey in particular, particular has been a pet for migration throughout history. Recent crises have made this past, uh, historical path also a, a destination for refugees. Unlike the gradual characteristics of migration, current refugee waves are acute and massive. When one country bears such a burden, that country also lifts the burden from other countries. For this reason, there is a need to assist border and buffer countries. During the Syrian refugee crisis, Turkey has given shelter to more than 3.6 million refugees in a period where some government built wall barbed wires to stop people seeking shelter. Migration and refugee waves are not an alternative to each, each other. Both can and do happen at the, at the same time and both interlace. As a member of parliament of a country that deal with, deals with uh, very di difficult migration challenges, I am happy to be here by this opportunity. I would like to thank the organizers of this event, all the participants and the technical staff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, now look, what I propose to do is this. I've got so far, and I think that's a lot, Greece, Algeria, Iraq, France, and the Moroccan Parliament, okay? We can get those in, and I think that's it. Uh, uh, who, 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 which, 
which country is that? That's in, in Morocco. Uh, well, we've got the Moroccan, wait a minute, we've got the Moroccan parliament here, Morocco as well. Okay, and that's it. Can you please keep them short, otherwise we'll run over time. So, Greece, please. Greece. Thank you, Mr. President, and thanks, Morocco, for hospitality. Uh, all you know that uh, country, my country, Greece, is the first host country for immigrants and refugees and tries to cope with uh, the ph this phenomenon with respect for human rights and international law. Greece is con convinced that efforts to achieve a global compact for dealing with refugee and migratory flows will be welcomed. We are convinced that effective immigration management can best be achieved through cooperation between countries of origin, transit, and destination on the basis of a holistic approach. Taking also into account the importance of the regional dimension of mig mig migration, especially in the Mediterranean destination region, which is both a region of origin, transit, uh, and uh, destination. It is affected by a very significant proportion of global migra migratory flows. We consider that the priority should include the following. Develop parliaments, initiatives, and actions to better exploit and further promote opportunities for safe, regular and smooth migration in accordance with national laws and respect for international law. Promoting the effective return and the red mission policies, giving priority to voluntary return with a special emphasis on the sustainable reintegration of uh, returnees, including the re uh, recognition and issuance of travel documents for the countries of origin. Developing actions and projects to promote the full social and economic integration of immigrants legally res residing in host countries, focusing on projects and uh, deciding for voluntary migrants and plans to integrate at local level something which has proved to be important. We have the view that the pact should be legally non-binding in border to allow the flexibility, flexibility in, of our actions and uh, this increase the effectiveness of its imp uh, implementation. The pact and its follow-up can promote the understanding of migration as a global phenomenon which requires a global response but which has specific regional factors and trends that need to be taken into account. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and then let's, let's go through it now. There's Algeria, yes, Iraq, France, and the Moroccan, Morocco. Now, are you, um, are you from the Moroccan parliament? Could I ask? Yes. Yeah, okay. So it, it's, it's uh, Algeria, Iraq, France, the Moroccan parliament, and then Morocco. Okay, that's it. So please, Algeria. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Mais uh, mon collègue a demandé la parole, mais quand même, je vais profiter. C'est une occasion. En or, je ne vais pas la lâcher. J'aimerais bien savoir, on parlait de, 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 de l'immigration. Vous savez, en Algérie, on a rapatrié presque en 2014 et en 2018, apparemment 38 463, dont 20 000 hommes et 17 000 femmes. Le problème qui se pose maintenant, est-ce que, j'ai demandé ce matin, est-ce qu'il y aura des aides pour que ces pays-là ouvrent leurs frontières Sinon, comment on peut, on, peut, on peut lutter contre cette... Immigration clandestine, parce qu'on n'a pas assez de richesses, d'autres pays n'ont pas assez de richesses pour pouvoir subvenir aux besoins de ces immigrants. Quand un immigrant, il n'a pas de quoi manger, il ne reconnaît même pas son, mère, son père ou sa mère. La, 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 la richesse qui est mal, mal divisée au niveau de ce, 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 ce monde, euh, c'est pour ça qu'on a tout le temps des immigrants qui viennent. Et on a jusqu'à maintenant, jusqu'à l'heure qu'ils viennent, il y a des immigrants maintenant qui rentrent de Tamaras. Maintenant, je pense que j'étais en train d'appeler pour leur donner un petit peu de ce qui se passe dans, dans, dans cette salle. Ils sont en train de dire qu'il y a maintenant des immigrants qui rentrent. On ne peut pas leur dire non. Ils n'ont pas de quoi manger. Donc, on devrait trouver une solution globale 
pour ce monde entier, dire comment partager cette richesse pour pouvoir laisser les gens qui veulent rester dans son pays, il doit rester dans ce pays. Si quelqu'un veut immigrer, il vient et il rentre avec honneur. Merci. Thank you, Algeria. Iraq, please. Iraq. Please. في البدء أوجه الشكر الجزيل للمملكة المغربية الشقيقة لدورها المميز في احتضان هذا المؤتمر إن الهجرة الاختيارية ظاهرة جيدة يتم خلالها نشر الثقافات بين البلدان والاستفادة من الخبرات والكفاءات لتنعم البشرية كلها من عطاء الإنسان العارف والعالم ولكن هناك ما يسمى بالهجرة القسرية أو الاضطرارية التي يضطر إليها الإنسان عندما يصبح مهددا بخطر المجاعة أو الخوف وانعدام الأمان وهذا النوع من الهجرة حصل في عدة أماكن في العالم ومن هذه الأماكن بعض مناطق الشرق الأوسط وأحد أسباب هذه الهجرة هو التدخلات الخارجية لبعض الدول المسيطرة والمتحكمة عالميا بمصير بعض الدول من خلال زج ثقافة العنصرية والتفرقة مما أدى إلى نزوح وتهجير الكثير من شعوب تلك البلدان السؤال هل تم تبني برنامج أو وضع فقرة في ميثاق العالمي لهجرة آمنة ومنظمة ومنتظمة تعمل على مناهضة وكبح هذه الأفعال غير الإنسانية التي تمارسها تلك الدول ضد الشعوب الفقيرة وشكرا Thank you very much indeed and next is France um, uh, Actuellement vous le savez la France traverse une crise grave Heureusement, les migrants ne sont pas visés actuellement. Je dis heureusement parce que les migrants sont souvent les boucs émissaires dans les pays en crise. Espérons que la situation se calme rapidement afin que nous puissions travailler au sein du Parlement français autour de ce pacte qui est une démarche importante pour le monde entier. Comme parlementaires, que pouvons-nous faire Très basiquement et concrètement, la signature de ce pacte, prochainement, doit être suivie d'une présentation devant nos parlements respectifs. En tant que parlementaires, nous pouvons nous engager à demander que cette ratification se fasse assez rapidement après la signature de Marrakech. Utilisons ce temps pour demander un débat entre parlementaires et apporter cette vision positive dont les uns et les autres ont parlé, cette vision positive des migrations à laquelle nous croyons à l'UIP. Également, nous pouvons faire pression, chacun et chacune, dans son pays, pour que le délai d'entrée en vigueur du pacte ne soit pas renvoyé trop loin dans le temps. Enfin, nous pouvons faire sur le site de l'UIP une banque des expériences réussies en matière d'immigration. Je vous remercie. Right. Thank you very much. Now, the Moroccan Parliament, please to be followed by the host country, Morocco. Okay. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. Uh, Rita Hatimi, uh, Barlama al-Maghribi. Mundu sanawat asbahat al-mamlaka al-Maghribiya balad al-iqama lil-adad al-adid min al-muhajirin ba'da an kanat badad al-abur faqat mima ja'ala al-siyasa al-Maghribiya ta'arifu ta'gheeran fi hada al-majal wa qamat sultat al-umumiya bimajhudat katira qanuniya wa amaliya لضمان حياة كريمة للوافدين عليها وأصبح المغرب يقوم بدور الحارس كغيره من دول شمال إفريقيا من أجل حد من التدفق المهاجرين على أوروبا ولكن بأي ثمن لا يمكن منع الهجرة بالقوانين وبوجود رجال أمن أو بناء جدار بل من اللازم علاجها بالقضاء على الأسباب المؤدية إليها ومن أهمها العمل على نبد الحروب وضمان التنمية الاقتصادية والعدالة الاجتماعية للبلدان الأصلية ولهذا السبب اعتمد المغرب تعاون جنوب جنوب الملاحظ أن الدول الغنية تشجع هجرة الأدمغة إليها وكذا السواعد عندما تحتاج إليها ولكنها تسد الباب وتكون ضد الهجرة فيما عدا ذلك كما أن مقاربة الهجرة هي مقاربة أمنية أكثر منها محاولة التعاون مع الدول الفقيرة لإيجاد تنمية مستدامة تجعل المواطنين يفضلون البقاء في بلادهم كما أن الإجراءات المتخدة غالبا ما تكون إجراءات على المدى القصير مؤقتة في الزمن بينما من الضروري وجود مقاربة 
تشاركية بين الدول الغنية والدول الفقيرة وتساؤلي ما هي الاستراتيجية متوسطة وطويلة الأمد فيها تعاون حقيقي مع محاولة التنسيق بين المنظمات الدولية والدول وكذا التزام الدول الغنية بتعهداتها للدول الفقيرة التي تستقبل عددا هائل من المهاجرين كما أن البرلمانات والدبلوماسية الموازية يمكنها أن تقوم بدور فعال لإعداد استراتيجية على المدى الطويل لإيجاد حلول فعالة لهذه الهجرة ولضمان حياة كريمة للأفراد الذين يهاجرون ونتمنى أن يكون الميثاق خطوة جيدة ينخرط كما خطرة جيدة ينخرط فيها جل الدول لما فيه مصلحة العام كل العالم وشكرا. Thank you very much and finally Morocco, our host country. Well, second of the host countries. Morocco. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je voudrais juste faire écho aux déclarations de Monsieur lors de l'ouverture de de cette importante réunion de Monsieur le Président de l'Assemblée de, de la Chambre des représentants, qui qualifiait ce pacte euh, à, une à la déclaration de, des droits de l'homme par son importance. Euh, Monsieur le Président, c'est donc donc euh, vrai, c'est un pacte très important, mais c'est sur la mise en œuvre de ce pacte qu'on sera jugé. Euh, effectivement, lorsqu'on pense à la mise en œuvre, on pense à l'Organisation internationale de la migration, c'est vrai, c'est une organisation apparentée au système des Nations Unies, mais peut-être le, le besoin est, est ce que peut-être ce serait euh, le temps pour ériger cette organisation intergouvernementale en une organisation spécialisée des Nations Unies et qui aurait donc, donc le, le poids politique, juridique, etc., pour mener à bien donc, les, les, la, la mise en œuvre de, cette, de ce pacte très important. Deuxièmement, Monsieur le Président, il y a les organisations régionales et je pense à l'Union africaine qui vient d'adopter son agenda pour la migration, donc la, la conférence de, de Nouakchott. C'est un engagement très fort, donc le Royaume du Maroc a pris sur lui la création d'un observatoire, un observatoire donc pour la migration, pour comprendre et euh, agir, donc vraiment pour, 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 pour euh, mettre corps à ce pacte national. Donc, quel sera, Monsieur le Président, un peu l'assistance de, de, du système des Nations Unies à ces initiatives régionales et internationales Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. Now we've given our panelists quite a hefty job. Uh, do you want to go first? Allô. Alors, j'essaie de me rappeler en quelle langue je dois parler. Bon, j'avais parlé français, en tout cas, il y a l'interprétation. Euh, il y a un point qui m'est revenu à l'esprit en écoutant euh, l'intervention de plusieurs pays, euh, dont l'Irak, qui parle justement de... et, à, et à les, les euh, Turkish-speaking countries, donc, euh, qui parle si bien des réfugiés et de la migration euh, forcée et involontaire que... Euh, de, de la migration qu'on qu appelle normalement économique. Donc, tout à fait, euh, je n'ai pas eu le temps de le présenter dans le détail dans mon, dans mon intervention, mais c'est justement un peu l'approche que le CICR essaye d'encourager vis-à-vis de la migration. Donc, il ne s'agit pas de réduire les statuts des réfugiés. Ça, évidemment, on n'y touche pas, c'est garanti par les droits internationaux des réfugiés, mais il faut aussi tenir en compte que tout le reste des migrants, au sens large, en situation régulière, en situation irrégulière, qu'ils s'échappent de désastres naturels, qu'ils s'échappent de changements climatiques, euh, de la pauvreté ou d'autres situations, sont des êtres humains qui ont leur dignité, leurs besoins de protection et qui ont une protection qui leur est octroyée par le droit international des droits de l'homme. Donc, et qui normalement est déjà réfléchi dans la législation nationale de la plupart euh, de nos pays. Donc, en fait, opérationnaliser le pacte mondial sur la migration signifie aussi essayer de tenir en compte tout ça. Donc, euh, ne pas se concentrer seulement sur les réfugiés et les demandeurs d'asile, mais aussi tenir en compte les besoins de ce, cette population des migrants qui est de plus en plus mixte. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. The last word. Very briefly, then. 
Um, there were, that was a lot of questions, and I cannot possibly do them all justice, but to group a few of the common themes, there was a theme there on root causes and a link to the SDGs and their, so, their sustainable development goals. And I think it's important to understand that the root causes of migration were an integral part of the conversation about the Global Compact, but the Global Compact cannot address all of the root causes, partially because there is a framework to address a lot of the root causes, and that is precisely the sustainable development goals. So that reference is there, that link needs to be made at the national level, and by the UN system in how it engages with countries. So that's, that's understood if, even if it looks underrepresented in the compact. In terms of, um, which is a huge area with a very brief answer, in terms of the UN system and the role of the UN system, the compact was speaking both to how states deal with um, migration and how they treat migrants, but also how the UN system manages its own work and looks at the issue of migration. And it's, a, it's done both of those things in the compact. What has been created by the Secretary General of the UN is a new UN migration network bringing together the relevant agencies that will be launched technically next week and will begin to do work to support member states in how they deliver on the, um, how they deliver on the compact. And part of that UN network on migration will be to provide technical assistance and guidance. Part of that will be to oversee a capacity building mechanism, which is to be a channel for funds precisely to work on how do you implement the Global Compact on Migration. So that doesn't answer all of the question about where will the resources come from, but that's one of the routes that is envisaged. Just to come back to you and your role in relation to those, the UN Migration Network in what it chooses to work on and the capacity building mechanism in what it chooses to fund will be guided by demand and demand from states. So do think about what it is that you need from the UN and communicate that with them. Um, about what it is that you would like their assistance with. And finally, to finish on the point on urgency, I could not agree more. We've spent two years, two and a bit years, if we consider the time from when the, three years, if we consider the time from when the New York Declaration was envisaged, having a conversation about migration governance and migration policy. Now, that needed to happen so that we could have a shift in narrative in how we talk about migration and how we think about migrants that was grounded in and born of the situation that we're seeing the situation that was being seen then, that situation has not got any better. It is now beholden on all of us to take that document that was born of that situation and make it be the change to that situation. We can't have spent three years negotiating a document that then sits on a shelf and does nothing for people who are in urgent need of a more humane response to their situation. Right. Timing is good. Can I, on your behalf, thank the panellists for the great job they've done. You've done... Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Can I thank you all for keeping to time? Uh, we've got 15 minutes. Please, can we come back here sharply at 4.25 for the last session today? Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very well, as, as, as before.